driven in this field and some of them just choose it so recently i met, met a person he wrote the very great book called the web accessibility cookbook and we'll be looking into that and uh, he uh, just was in the field of accessibility because it should happen it is not like uh, he had some connection and he had uh, someone in his family or something like that to make it because uh, it's a thing that we all must do for me it is like i grew up next to a mother who was teaching kids between 2 to 14 year olds and they were people with special needs in the category that they were partial or total deafness so i went to this school just before coming here to san francisco i have never been to anywhere outside of india for the first one, first time and i just uh, go to this teacher and talk about how can i make things more accessible to these uh, people or how can i just help or volunteer as uh, as, as a techie so she tells me that think of a 15 year old as a 5 year old and how you can just make something creative make maybe in tech you can just make some small game or something like that and you can just uh, have them see it maybe they will not like it and just iterate and iterate and it's it's a never ending process so that that's what user experience is so the point of this whole conversation is slide is that we i do not want this slide to get exhausted i want us to talk so we will be successful if i do not come to the last page of this slide till the end of the session that's the point so yeah uh, has anybody anything to talk about accessibility? I want you guys to talk first and just stay the lead. Yeah, please. Wait, not in these contexts, but I was a math teacher and I had a student with Down syndrome. So I was teaching him how to count, after how to count is how to add one, because it's just counting, basically how to add two and when we reached the point to count three he was having problems switching to the next uh dog the the, the senna tense like 19 plus three yeah going to the 20 yeah. something answer yeah what problem I had the number board there. He was having problems changing lines. So looking for solutions, I it happened that I went to Japan. I bought a Japanese abacus that goes yeah. one, two, three, four, five is another thing. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, cha cha cha. On the airplane back, I was reading the instructions. Yeah. So I gave him the abacus and we started again counting. One, two, three, ta, ta. Because he had to learn the mechanics of that. So we started again with counting. Then we started again with plus one. So seven plus one, he had to put the seven at one and then write the answer. Yeah. Uh, then two. Then, then I didn't teach him three. Like a year after, he was doing additions, three digit additions with the abacus. He found out whatever. I had another student with um, this disorder, but they lose their mind, they're thinking of another thing. But I mean, he was very bright. He was like, by that time he was 14 years old doing high school math. Yeah. I mean, that's why he was like doing like this all the time in class, not paying attention because he was so bright that the class was boring. <laughs> so, uh, so he was behind this um, student when he was doing the addition and you would see da, 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 the movement of his hand and he was, what is he doing? He's getting it right. He was amazed of what this boy was doing and I don't know. I just taught him how to add yeah. up to two and he figured things out by his own. So that is one thing, let, because the disability doesn't need, need, need to be 
the people with the glasses or yeah. it can mean these uh, well, you have whatever sequence of letters the psychologist give you it's also considered a disability on certain situations yeah. right it's, uh, so it's uh, you just need to look what works for the person. Some people are kinetic, some people are... Um, intellectual. They, 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 they get things more yeah. by listening yeah, and yeah. some... The kinetic is because of movement, like this person with Down syndrome. Some people learn because of they listen and some people learn because of what they see. Yeah. yeah. Visual people. Visual. So you just, as a mentor, you just have to figure out what they are. Yeah. That's why written communication, visual communication, it's good. It is. And of course, the mechanics exercises. Yeah, so whenever we evolve into tech, we do see the real life instrument. So if you see a switch of a light bulb, then you have switches in your front end in HTML. So the way that we design something, it should be corresponding to something that exists in the real space and they are able to adapt it. And not just, uh, I would say that everyone has something in, because the world is neurodiverse. So I would talk about that 1.3 billion people or 16 to 20%, this is from the World Web Consortium, have a significant minor or major special need occurring in, in the world today. So it's like one in every five has something and we're talking about the various categories, the various levels that exist. But yeah, so it's like we have to build something for a global audience today. So if you look at YouTube, then you have something like captions that are beneath it. And it like helps you a lot if you are uh, watching a video which is of a different language or a different accent, you're not able to pick up the pace of that language or something like that. But now think of a person who just cannot hear as a partial or total deafness. For him, that subtitle is a need. For him, he needs that to be able to use it. And, and in our case also, let's say we are at a library and we just forgot our earphones. We just don't have it at the moment. Or there is something wrong with the speakers and we just want to uh, watch a video, then we would be needing it too. So the way that we build thing is that we are providing a necessity for some but it is a feature for everyone and i know that for developers they say that yeah we are, have to do something extra they just don't want to do it but it, it's just really put out for the best so everyone should be making things more accessible and if someone has just done something like that i would want you to communicate about something that you have built and maybe yeah please do. yeah um no thanks from Asia, but i'm working for archive uh the preprint server um so we are very aware of this problem. Our web, by by of course by US uh, requirements, our websites have to be accessible. But that is not really a solution because the PDFs we are shipping. I mean, I I'm not sure everyone knows archive. Archive is the oldest preprint server. We have about a few million articles of research. The biggest research on LLM, for example, are first and often only published on archive. And so we have started some one and a half two years ago. To work with handicapped researchers um, and so what we have shipped out like a few months ago is that for every new article uh, we pro provide also an HTML version. The reason is um, that PDFs are as they are today are not accessible. Whatever your government says about it should, uh, should stay with PDF 1.7 accessibility this is complete rubbish. Even Adobe agrees that PDF 1.567, the accessibility is completely useless. You can you can take a screen reader and read out the PDF, and it's a huge disaster. Yeah. Um, if you so PDF UA2 is working on this. I'm also in the PDF Association for standardizing this. Um, there is a lot of work, but in generally, um, I see still a lot of especially governmental organizations shipping out PDFs and PDFs are hugely problematic from the accessibility standpoint. Um, so on Archive we have, we have now, we are backfilling now all the catalog back to the 1980s, uh, but that takes a lot of time and costs. 
because that runs in the cloud and costs us a lot of money. Um, but uh, so new articles at the last few years are now completely available in HTML and that has, so from personal experience and from feedback from researchers all over the world, it was a resounding success. So what I want to say is that if you are in a situation or in an environment or an organization that produces documents, uh, think about not using only PDF because it is, even if it says PDF 1.7 accessible, it's not really accessible. Yeah, it's not. That, that's pretty great point that you put out. Anyone else who has just developed something that they may want, yeah, please do. I have not built anything, but this is something I use. Yeah. So, like, I self identify myself as somewhere on the dyslexic uh, spectrum, and it, uh, the, the text information is hard for me to read. Uh, so, I discovered this font called Open Dyslexic, and I use it now for all my desktop needs. and. A lot of sites don't support you to change the font for reading. So, uh, like some of the browsers have this read mode, which which might support that. So that is uh, helpful in that. But as a developer, I feel like um, most of the documents backdates to like early websites, which is really yeah. hard to read yeah. for me. So like having tools or plugins like this, which makes it makes things a little bit easier, uh, skimmable actually. Yeah. Uh, like I, I don't read through things, I skim through things yeah. too. So so uh, building something like that could, could help a lot of people in that. And, yeah, and it's not even like that I have a huge disability or something, it's just, as she said, it's a learning thing. So uh, yeah, you don't need to have a visible disability to it could be any kind and it's just the neurodiverse universe as I said. Yeah. So anyone else who wants to just break out any yep. Please. I just wanted to uh, because to make my notes make sense. I'm call I'm calling this the curb cut effect. Um, <laughs> because it's a classic example of um, you make the curb cuts for people using a wheelchair and people with a heavy package, people with a stroller, um, people who like have other minor mobility issues. Also like who can technically like who don't technically need the curb cut still have quality of life improvement. Um, yeah, definitely, we just built for, uh, let's say, a necessity for somewhere, but it is a same feature for all, so everyone just gets a good thing. And yeah, you just talked about scanning, uh, that you just scan or skim through things, so there is a very good concept called uh, scanning, modeling, I don't know if it's visible, uh, or am I supposed to be too low? These are some three concepts, and if you have heard of it, just feel free to just share, or I can just give you a story time for this, and I can just talk about. It. So no one, okay. So uh, it's basically like when we visit a website, let's say I want to do uh, something like I want a converter or something to just convert a PNG to let's say a WebP for compression. Then what I will do is I will just Google search. I will try to find something that uh, my main intention is, is just compresses directly. Does it ask me for a login? And sure, as it doesn't ask me that, I should just, just give my credit card to it. <laughs> so that, that's the very basic thing. So I would just scan through some of the websites and there's this, this thing that I would just muddle through it. I would just struggle through it. I would just try to find what I want. And the final thing is when I get it, the particular site, I will be satisfied, which means that again, if I need it, I will be visiting the same website, just cutting through all the things, even if there is a better one available, which is not, was not visible to me. So yeah, there is this thing that we in user experience have to make websites and just go backwards for this and just make something that is easily scannable, easily or, or the thing is like priority available that you don't have to sign up or it's not a credit card that is required or and it directly just satisfies you it just gives you the thing that you want and if we just track back then if we take care of this it is much more accessible it is much more user friendly so yeah if, if someone just finds it more and want to elaborate on it please feel free to do so it's just there's no wrong answer in this anyone Oh, that's right. so I, I, I'm not sure if I, if I would like to mix user usability and user interface with accessibility for a handicapped person yeah, because 
I mean, what is usable for me as a fully sighted and hearing and seeing, like everything, this is completely different from what a people that need accessibility access uh, have. Uh, so, so I, I wouldn't want these two to muddle completely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely, because uh, for accessibility, we would be carrying it out in a way that it is, uh, I would say, much important to all the types of users and not just be a user interface thing. And yeah, I was just looking for what do we have next. I just, uh, can someone just uh, try to think what this particular representation means and if someone just know about this equity versus equality thing just feel free to talk about it and then I can just take this brief. So equality is basically giving everyone the same thing and equity is uh, trying to accommodate to their needs so they have the same experience. Yeah, definitely I, I do see that many of you are not talking I would just want you to be a bit more interactive it just helps out a lot that's the whole point of the session because when I came here I was introvert I chickened out and everything I didn't want you to talk but yesterday I had this particular thing called the video shoot where just Mary and I were talking and she told me that you, you need to talk about that that's not how it works because in the later time when you are just coding behind your laptop you're just doing 20% of the work the rest 80% is presentation of your work because if you don't do it someone else might take your credit so please feel free to just talk because there's nothing wrong the worst you will do is just make fun of yourself in front of others that's that's totally totally okay so if someone wants to talk just anything anything wrong anything that they had they had for breakfast something like that just, just, just feel free to talk So, okay. So yeah, I will be talking about this particular thing is that uh, as, uh, can you just please tell me your name? Asta. As Asta said very clearly that you should accommodate for people in this equity thing. So it's just like, uh, why shouldn't I just create the same thing and just feel that everyone will be able to use it? It's not the case. You have a neurodiverse audience and you will have to look from the eyes of a, I would say, a, user who might be struggling to do this so there was a thing when back when they were designing uh, refrigerator designs so there was this woman called patricia moore and i do not i'm not sure if it is the 90s or is the 80s but uh, there was this thing that people were trying to figure out various designs for this refrigerator and yeah it is a story time right now so because you guys are not talking so she was just <laughs> trying to uh, make it that uh, how can I make this refrigerator for a work for all type of people? Is the lock and key mechanism okay or not? And she was told by her company that we don't design for them. And she was just shocked to hear that they're just designing for people who are, uh, I would say, pretty much able to just use it, but not for everyone. And that uh, I would say if someone tells this to me at my company, I would just not be able to tolerate that because how can you not uh, think of designing for everyone? So she took her own time and in her own time she did a few things. She just uh, tried to tighten her arm near this and just she tried to open it or she just tied herself to a wheelchair and just tried to open it. She tried a lot many things to be able to create that kind of a design that we see right now in our refrigerator. It is designed with empathy and whenever you open it, you can just feel the empathy that Patricia Moore has given to the world that everyone would be able to use it easily. Good. Yeah. Uh, anyone, um, I feel that this is a very awkward silence. Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, one of the, uh, we, what we try to do is to, um, like for color CSS, um, we use like waves, um, as you guys heard of it, so to accommodate like people who have like color like lip yeah. or color, um, yeah, impairment. So I was wondering, like, uh, that's the only thing probably we do for our software. But if there's like anything else you guys do in addition to like matching colors and stuff like that, like other um, techniques you guys use for web web uh, web application, like you probably like try out to read if this is screen reader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is one of the the, the best tests. Uh -huh. um, you this is very easy to test yourself. You can see does it 
so the, the point is that the website is not profit in the if it's a web app, I assume, because it says here that, and the screen reader might jump in an illogical way, so not in the way you are supposed to read the page, right? And so that is something that would probably help most people just check that the screen reader reads the page in a reasonable way. And then if you have other things as text, like tables, uh, images, always add, uh, that is also checked by screen reader, add alt text or for tables add a description of uh, what is in the table. There are nowadays also actually good tools that you can create tables and graphics in a way uh, via SVG and, and so the screen readers can actually allow you to go over the axis, for example, of a graph or if you have bar charts, go over the bar charts one by one and tell, read you out the numbers. That is super nice if you do this. This is, I mean, that's like the alpha plus. But I mean, testing with a screen reader, I mean, CSS checks are good, uh, screen readers are good. There is a very good page, I, I have to check it, and, and this is, uh, I have to check where it's fine, where a researcher lists things that might, that are good for checking to make websites or web applications accessible. Has everyone heard of WCAG? WCAG, yeah. 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 So there's this WCAG contrast checker that, that you also told that we have to check the contrast for those level of conformities, AA, AAA, depending on the size. We will be taking a look into that, but yeah, furthermore, I want to just ask everyone what do they use currently in their own projects and uh, in their GSOC projects as well, or it could be just anything in general in the terms of accessibility or usability, something like that. So anyone if you want to just elaborate on the points. So our outreach project this year was to get as many of our tools, uh, WCAG, if not fully compliant, more compliant. Um, we're going to run in, like, we're kind of doing low-hanging fruit first, and eventually we get to the problem where it's the uh, HTML5 interactive uh, whole slide image, and we're not currently sure how we're going to solve that, but we got to talk to people. Yeah. Um, and that's something I wanted to bring up is about, uh, like, we're talking about uh, design-related things, about uh, personas, user stories, or whatever the, the Vogue term is for that kind of user modeling. Um, I, I typically, like, I mean, step zero is to try it yourself, but then you have to verify them, is uh, especially like people mental models. I talked with someone who was a data scientist, uh, worked on calling the visualizations is incorrect, but um, it, audio graphs, um, and it was super interesting. And as a result, uh, completely blind, had an entirely different idea or mental concept for these, uh, I want to call them visualizations so bad because I can't think of a better word for them, but non-visual visualizations. Um, and if, you don't, if you're not curious enough to find this thing, you'll end up kind of inevitably, and you will, I think, you will repeatedly end up accidentally reinforcing your own uh, biases and you have to constantly fight that. So, uh, Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I found that very interesting, as you said, about uh, the order in which the screen reader reads the page because um, to make it uh, more eye catchable or easier to read, we, we put headline in the middle and then there is some text at the above and below that there's some description and then there are uh, different HTML tags to do that. So, um, uh, so are screen readers equipped to read it in that way when the designers? how the designers has meant for a visual user or, uh, or do we need to configure them or uh, does anyone know how this has to work? Okay, so I will just be giving a very, uh, I don't say a very raw HTML semantic and it may be that if you're using some framework then you will have to just see how you can incorporate this. So if you have something that you should be uh, first having something called a skip link that should be at the very top so it's just that uh, when you want to go to the main content and every page has something like a hero section or something that every time re is being read by the uh, screen reader then a person would not uh, like it after some time who is just using that so just having a skip to the main content and you have seen many websites just do that so you just press tab and it just appears out of nowhere 
you just press tab again it just takes you to the uh, thing and you should be just using the right semantics i have used uh, i've seen people just try to do things like uh, if you have a card they try to make the entire card clickable by just making the whole div clickable and it's not a good thing because the screen reader will just read out the entire thing in that and uh, I have uh, read out a very good book, I, it is in the slide so you don't worry about it but you can do something like making a button here clickable and uh, just adding a pseudo element which is just like you are just uh, making it the same size as of the whole card so the entire card becomes clickable for you so you are not messing up the semantics plus you are just reassuring what your designer has just made for you so yeah th this is just one of the many things and yeah we'll be taking a look in that as well so i'll just go to the next slide and yeah this is on neurodiversity you can just read the whole thing on the i will be giving you the slide so you don't have to worry about it and if someone would want to just talk about any of the things mentioned here, I would be very lovely because if I talk, it would be very monotonous and you will not like my voice after some time. Mm -hmm. Please. Especially if anyone has ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you feel that everyone... No, yeah. I actually have a question. So, Please. Yeah, yeah, that's aside from the obvious one, which are, I would say, dyslexia or whatever. So uh, uh, the first thing you said was how dyslexia or just having troubles with letters, words, yeah, uh, Here you have typing that could be coded, like choosing the right fonts, for example. Yeah, so there is a thing that you will have to choose something like a humanist font and you will have to design it in a way that a person would be able to feel that it is more legible. So you have some fonts that have this kind of... L and it has some kind of I and it has some kind of one and and they all look the same and and it, it is a problem it is a problem not if you uh, know the whole word but it is a problem let's say if it is a code and it can be a problem in words as well so just try to pick up something like a humanist font and there is another thing so let's say I was designing a thing for payment and it was like a credit card uh, I would say text box and I gave it to one of my developers because uh, who as a senior wants to code himself so yeah just give it to a developer so uh, there was this thing that he made a uh, text uh, box he just made an input field with a number and just the numeric keypad the normal things but when you just enter the numbers they were just all closed and it was for your credit card so I told him why not just paste it after every four he said that it would be a lot of work I don't want to do that so uh, there's this thing you don't want uh, people who yeah, yeah just just leave it yeah just just, just ship it you, you just approve my pull request so yeah it, it doesn't work like that you will have to take into accountability that some designs are made to be I would say more uh, related to the real world things and they are made so that they are understandable by all they, they would look like, yeah, I can understand it, but yeah, for everyone, you may have seen sometimes the phone numbers get formatted in a very good way and sometimes it does not. So many people are not doing it right, many people don't want to do it right, many people are just not managing it right, but you will have to just do the right thing in the rightful way. And this is just one of the examples. I would want you to uh, read that link, I would give it to you. And there are many types of things here, but there is one more thing I want to mention which is especially to the liquid galaxy community if you know that we do things on Google Earth and Google Maps we just make something like a big panoramic screen and you can control it using your phone or you can just use something called a space navigator so a space navigator looks like a joystick it's like a device that you have to hold and control it but uh, not only that it is expensive, it's like 600 euros to, no, less. The Space Navigator? Yes, Space Navigator. 120. 120, but, but for India it was 600 when I was oh. trying to buy it. So, yeah, oh. it was expensive. That is so cool. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't want to buy it. And the other thing was that if someone has like arthritis or something that 
he is not able to just hold it well then he will be facing a problem so there must be a solution in user experience that could bring out the best in accessibility so uh, you have that you can use uh, something called we, we did a project it was called the super liquid galaxy controller to use multiple ways to do that so there is a thing called the google game face which is like 461 data points on your face so someone who has something like a paralysis below the neck he can just use his face to control google earth and we were able to achieve uh, these things and as well as using some uh, TensorFlow pre-available uh, touch controls to be able to just use your uh, I would say your whole body to just make some movements to you control Google Earth so yeah these are some of the things and some of the ways also not to mention that uh, not forget to mention that the touch screen controls just using in your app so you don't have to hold something and you can just use your Google Maps to just uh, move to places to control Google Earth, which, which is very fantastic to be honest. So uh, yeah, there are multiple types of things and there are multiple cases and uh, whenever you hear from a user experience, I would say any person, then he would say it depends. It depends on the product that how, what you want to do. And there was a, a meme like uh, a person who is a, uh, it was shared by a UX director at uh, the Zurich office at Google and he just, uh, we were talking to each other and he just said that he, he made a, a parrot that was at a meme and he just said it depends, the parrot was saying it depends and he became a UX director at Google by just saying that. So <laughs> yeah, th that was just a uh, meme thing, don't just, don't just think that you can just do that in interviews and get to that place, so please, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we already talked about if someone else wants to just talk something else, please feel free to do so. Any questions if someone has? Because it would be just, I don't want to just occupy your whole headspace with what I'm saying. So, okay. So uh, yeah, this thing of scanning, modeling and satisficing i have seen that it is not just for the people who are uh, like it is not just for us if we are reading a newspaper the people who would have uh, are reading through a screen reader are also not they don't also don't want to read the whole thing they would be just jumping the headings jumping the content they want to also uh, muddle through it they just want to get to the part that they love to read and they will just stick to that particular thing that they uh, would uh, want to read and there is a very good book called the don't make me think it is a book on common sense which i believe is not so common at the moment <laughs> how developers are just doing some of the website that don't look so accessible so uh, yeah just do check it out it just tells a lot about accessibility user experience and some things in general so and yeah if anyone just wants to talk about his project which was not accessible or he, he feels just after this whole conversation that might not be accessible because i think that we should just look at the other way if people are not talking so it might be that you made something that you feel is not accessible please feel free to talk about it because everyone started like that so accessibility is ultimately some kind of spectrum um you have to at some point decide who you're designing for. Um, and there's, I guess, the bell curve is a fast simplification. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to just generally make something accessible, I think you end up missing a lot of specific use cases. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, it, it, I would say it's a forever going thing with your application. There's just user experience and things like that, they never end. You just have to keep iterating over it, keep iterating over it. You may find something, yeah, please do. Yeah, please. So, um, my project is Piggy Routing. It's about routing. I already participated in a project in Hiawase Nomura, Kobe. Never been there. Oh, no, yes, I've been there, but not to that park. It's a park for the elderly. And it has hospitals, any kind of hospitals, the road, the paths, the paths with the dots for the blind and stuff. So it's a routing application for them. And where I'm going to is not only the application, you need the data. They had to send a crew of people to even measure the angle of the ramp, the width of the ramp. 
because you have a wide wheelchair it doesn't fit here or to make sure that the application that is going to give you instructions in loud voice will tell you to the left there is a bench to the right there is a fountain that you can see it on the edge of the fountain so that can be done because of the data so it's not only the algorithms that are, have to yes. process but also the quality of the data definitely definitely you just have to make things and it is not just the data you have to just design it right from the very beginning the yes. thing yeah, I, I just have one thing that we learned from, from the researchers who are working in is that uh, anything is better than nothing. So that means even if you make a small, very small step on your web application, on your program, on whatever you do, even if it sounds like a triviality, this little bit helps people. So. The HTML we are shipping in archive is has still a huge amount of problems. We have an easy report button. We have tens of thousands of reports. It just takes ages to fix all this. But it's like, okay, at least we can read 90% or 80%. And this is better. This is like with a small step, you can reach many more people and achieve much more. It's not, it's not a accessible or not accessible it's as you mentioned before it's a spectrum and any small step helps a lot and so that's why everyone should do that just a little bit only and that would be already a great step forward yeah definitely anything that you can do just anything that you may think that can make it more accessible just search about it and just do it just don't just wait for someone to just tell you about it and you may find that some people are finding it easier after you have done it. So that, that's good. I, I do want to ask you if someone has any favorite books in, and I would want to hear because I do feel that these books that I have right now, many of them have uh, been just launched in 2024, except the Don't Make Me Think one. And it's, it's a very outstanding book by Steve Brook. It's the number one best-selling in US. But yeah, if someone just has anything, any books that they have read in the recent time, could be just anything. So just feel free to just talk about it. Not, not necessarily. Yeah. So no one reads books? <laughs> I'm sure every, I mean, maybe everyone's the wrong word, but I'm sure people have read The Design of Everyday Things. Yeah. Which is kind of like the, the classic introduction to design affordances like design thinking, that kind of thing. Um, I always find it funny, he's talking as like, yeah, and there's this computer thing, and people are like starting to figure out design for it. It's kind of like a weird, um, yeah. I was trying to find, there was a very specific book that someone very strongly recommended. It's like, cool, he's only so-so on equity. So there was a book that people reckon he may have been one of these, but I'll see if I can find it. Shoot. Yeah. If you find it, just let us know. And yeah, so these three books, I'll be just talking a bit about them. So if you are interested, you can just later look at it because you guys have not been reading books. Santa Claus will not be happy for you. <laughs> so you will not be getting gifts because you don't read books. Science fiction books? Yeah. <laughs> fiction, yeah, please. Science fiction. <laughs> Science fiction books, yeah. Also that. Still, still good. So you'll be getting something. So, yeah, the first one is the Web Accessibility Cookbook. It is just directly straight to the point. The writer doesn't waste any time in just convincing users that they should make things accessible. It is just directly telling you what semantics to use, what are the anti-patterns that people use but should not use, and what if what type of chronicles you'll face if you just do some, I would say, high number tab indexing all over your website to just think that you are making things right, but you're not. So. And the I, I, ca I can recommend visiting a few Japanese websites while reading such a book. Yeah. Because then you have counter examples to every single <laughs> there. Yeah. You may have <coughs> the like good old Yahoo websites or so, yeah. but they are, they are still so. I mean, I live in Japan, so the, most of the Japanese websites are really horrible. I mean, the, like graphical buttons without alt text and, and like lots of flashing and. 
like a huge density of information. So it's like, yeah, if you, if, if you want to enjoy reading this book with an antithesis, just look up some nice pages. Yeah. Japanese news pages, newspaper pages are a good example. <laughs> they are very good example if you just want to go there. So yeah, the Japanese website, they have a thing like maximalism. So there would be like everything at once and you'll be just facing everything at once. It would be just too much for you. But yeah, some websites have this minimalism, which is like very contrary to it. And it, it maybe it depends on the design for whom you want to make. I've heard that someone made a minimalistic website for the Japanese community and they didn't like it. They, they just stick to what they love. It's their, it's in their culture. They, they see the streets, it's all maximalism in the real world. It's maximalism on the website. So it just corresponds to them better. If someone has some experience in, I would say user experience in some product that they find good to use very easy. Like, like I find this bottle very good. It just opens for me so well. I don't know. And yeah, anything. It's not just you have to look for websites. It could be a product. It could be a product design that has so good user experience. So if anyone just wants to talk. I want to talk about the theater. Yeah, okay. sure. Just just market it. Because I read lots of books. I'm not going to recommend because I don't know what people like here. But my user experience in theater is amazing because you can, I love that you can make it the letters big or small yeah. as you need. And you, I know you can brighten the light or not. So. For me, this is a very good design product. Do you have a paperback? Uh, it's the Oasis. But it's, it's similar. And it also, uh, it's so well thought that I cannot live without it now. <laughs> is it like black and white or is it a color? It's black and white. Um, I heard it's I do have. Yeah. I think mine is not the Oasis, but yeah, it, it's just so. I would say easy to read on the Kindle. It just doesn't strain your eyes if you are just reading for a long time. It's just better if you are on a flight and you just want to read it. Yeah, we can send this video to Jeff Bezos. He might just give us some incentive. So, <laughs> so the next thing is the design for impact. It's by Aaron Beagle. It is that you should uh, try to think of designs as uh, an unbiased design that you have made for your website might bring out better results than something that has your own bias that you felt uh, is right. So I will just talk about this guy called, I don't know. You need to be right bigger. <laughs> yeah, I need to write bigger. Yeah, yeah, bigger. Yeah. And I will be way bigger now. So. You need to add some alt text. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would be just adding more accessibility to this. So there was this guy named Ronald Fisher who was given some agriculture data and he was just making a design or a product. He was a user researcher. So he was just researching onto things that can uh, impact onto the design of a product. And he used to do a thing that he was making tea. Uh, just he, they, they love to drink tea with his colleagues. And he was just pouring the, uh, he, he had hot water and was just pouring milk uh, not uh, yeah, the milk into the tea. So his uh, colleague said, you don't do that. You just don't have to pour milk into the tea. You just you pour tea, uh, you pour milk into the tea. You just pour, you just do it the other way. You just uh, hot up the milk and you just pour the tea in it. And then they were just having an argument that they taste different. If you just have a boiling hot uh, tea and you just pour milk in it, or if you have milk and you pour tea in it. And uh, after some thought, Ronald Fisher said, the order doesn't matter. The way I pour it, it doesn't matter. So uh, they were just quarreling about it, but because they were user researchers and they were not us to just make a duel or fight about it. So they decided that they would be making an unbiased test. So here it is that they made eight cups of milk and tea and eight cups of tea and milk. And they just randomized it. You do not know which one is what, so there is no bias now. You you just have to drink and just figure out. And later we checked they had something written on the bottom if it is a type 1 or type 2. And one of it drinks it and they found out they guessed all of it right. And 
the other guy was just finding so yeah there is a chemical reaction that happens it, it is different and it was just later figured out so they were just trying to see that why did it happen they were just trying to calculate the probability that uh, how that happened it was like something like uh, they were just amazed that there is a difference and Ronald Fisher just got to know from this particular team thing that all the data that he has doesn't make sense it was all biased data that he was getting so he was not able to figure out a good thing for his product a good design for his product so every time you are accounting for a data and i'll be talking about it in a more technical way too if you want obviously if you don't want to hear me i can just shut up and you can just can talk but he uh, did figure out that an unbiased data can make things much more better in user experience which also includes much more better accessibility sometimes we just think that what are cognitive thinking it and we don't just practice this thing called cognitive distancing from your own product we just try to bias it out try to think yeah i know this this may work but but you don't really know that you have to think from everyone's eyes there's this this diversity there's this inclusivity so you have to care about it so yeah if someone just want to talk about it yeah, if someone finds the story nice so there's there are head okay so one guy finds the story nice two guys <laughs> those who didn't find the story nice yeah <laughs> yeah so it's like the this about usability tests <coughs> usability test is very important yeah and this one was more of a a b test so there was an a and there was a b and they were just try to figure out things in that and uh, you do know that a b testing is like really important to uh, figure out what is i would say giving you a good metric on your product so for youtube they had this thing that you may have seen youtube doesn't have a count for dislikes you you don't have it right now so they made something like an a group and a b group to figure out that if uh, we have this variant and the experiment groups and we have no confounds in it i will talk about confounds so and, and they just figured out that people who see that more dislikes are existing they just have a just think of it as a bad experience on the all over of the app so they just removed it and that was the result of one of the ab tests that was unbiased much like the ronald fisher experiment that was so much unbiased so yeah there is this unbiased thing and if someone has done any ab testings and if someone just want to talk about it or just any usability testings anything in general oh, ab testing is a huge topic <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a huge topic of its own <laughs> it's, it's, it's i've done this for a huge Yeah. one of the biggest companies in Japan this yeah. is i mean ap testing is really hard and yeah. but it gives you what you mentioned insights i mean the fam most famous is probably the the case of the the switching the search to have bold text marked up that was pushed back by upper management for seven years or six years and then within three months created billions of more in, uh, income <coughs> at google so that was uh, oh no it's being sorry um yeah so ap testing is a good thing to do but it is not trivial um especially because you see unbiased ap testing this is one of the most difficult things to get right um so user randomization is not enough because normally every company runs multiple ap tests and then you have certain cross effects you have to be very careful so i strongly recommend having a good statistic Uh, working on the AP test. There's a very good book from the God of AP testing um, that I can recommend. Sure. Like so yeah. keep ethics in mind, like respect for persons. You uh, don't do anything that is going to cause harm. Um, we talked, to, I think, we haven't talked about um, extraneous cognitive load, especially people with disabilities, either neurodivergence or use of screen readers. There is an additional set of cognitive load that is not task related they must keep in mind. So when you're designing a test, uh just don't make it evil i guess it's the best way to put it <laughs> if yeah. google won't say it i will <laughs> but normally you test something you think this is good for your website <laughs> yeah. so 
So I think we are just very short on time. So I will just be thinking one of the things that is probably. Yash, yeah. I wanted to know about the third book. You the want most to important. know about the third book? Okay. The most important we, one. We can do that. It is, it is a very important <laughs> because book. Because it is something that Steve Krug uh, has uh, published and it was also the number one best-selling book on user experience. It is called the Don't Make Me Think to build common sense into your work, into your websites, applications, whatever. To make it so straightforward, which is called the Krug's Law of Usability, that you shouldn't be thinking twice. So you shouldn't be doing something like is job submit, and I hope I'm writing it big now. So there is this job submit button that you could have made as a button, you could have made it as a link. You could have made it as a text which was somewhere between your paragraphs or you could have just made it a button but you have written something like a job or oh, Rama thing or something that you just use in your own vocabulary and someone does not understand it. So it's more about how you can build things that are easier for someone to understand by not building a cognitive load into them. You should not be focusing on your own internal vocabulary. I've seen many, uh, e even at my own company, we use term, some term called Tech Evolve, which is nothing but your app services. So just, just try to build things that are easy for someone to understand, remember, and read. I, I think we are out of time now. If you like this session, just uh, the, the books are on the notes. Um, some of the things you link to, I've found links for but I do not have a link to your slides, which I assume you want to give I will be giving the link. I will just write my email here. It's a very short one. I made a very short one. <laughs> yeah, because yesterday I had the longest email that you could. D-I-Z-Z. So it's D-I-Z-Z-9-A and at the end. 9-A. Let me just make sure it's 9-A or not. <laughs> it should be. I don't want you to just mailing a. Yeah, it's B I double Z nine So, are you okay with your email being in the notes for this meeting? You can do that. So you just email me. I will just send you this, or I can just automate things. So it just sends by. Every time anyone emails.